Uh, good morning. Many of you have asked during the past couple of weeks for a briefing on the search and the salvage operations. That's been a, a very busy area, as you know, ever since the accident. And uh, two of the, the major people working in this area uh, have been able to come out today to talk to you. Colonel Ed O'Connor from the Eastern Space and Missile Center, who is the Director of Search and Recovery Operations, uh, working with NASA, and Captain Bart Bartholomew, who is the U.S. Navy Supervisor of Salvage from the uh, Naval Sea Systems Command in Washington, are both here. And we'll begin with Colonel O'Connor. Well, I'm happy to see you all here this morning, and uh, hope to give you a little explanation of the difficulty of the search and recovery activity we're involved in here. The first chart that I'd like to show you is a chart of the recovery area that we have designated as a prime area for recovery activity. It is a rectangle, 10 nautical miles by 25 nautical miles. As you can see on the chart, we've indicated the areas that are associated with the Gulf Stream, which is basically the entire search area. We're experiencing ocean currents from the Gulf Stream starting at about a half knot to a full knot up to almost four and a half knots. This is a, a difficult situation for the Navy to deal with in recovery activity, as well as difficult for us to deal with from the standpoint of getting remotely operated vehicles down to image components so we can do a, a good identification, a positive identification. I know everybody's been uh, very patient and waiting for us to get these firm identifications. It has been difficult. Looking at that chart, you can see that it's a, a huge area to be covered, 250 nautical miles of ocean. Also, there are a few areas that are outside of that box that we also have to go and document fully. The next chart I'd like to show you is the chart of how we are conducting the search area. Next chart, please. This chart shows that we're doing a very methodical job using naval assets involving side-looking sonars. These sonars are tracking through the 250 nautical mile box, documenting every square inch of ocean bottom. As we identify targets, sonar returns, we go out with either diving teams, remotely operated vehicles with video equipment aboard, or other assets so we can go down there and we can identify in a positive manner what the particular item is. As you're well aware, we have done some initial recovery activity on an IUS location. It was shown on the previous box as the closest area inshore. It's in approximately 120 feet of water, and we're using diving teams at this point to go in there and do that recovery. Another area that everybody has been concerned about is the identification of the right SRB. I'd like to show you a sonar trace now that we have off of a location that we were able to track with our radars on the Eastern Space and Missile Center range taking the right SRB very close to the water, getting a water impact point, then going out and confirming with sonar that this indeed was a debris field, and that's the term that we use because it has a lot of components scattered over a wide area. In that debris field, we have now placed a, the Sea Link, which is a small submersible vessel manned with a crew of four, and they have gone down and they've taken video as well as still photography of the area. We've also recovered some small components. We're going to supply later to you some photographs that were taken of a hydraulic reservoir and a fuel supply module. <clears throat> I'd like to say right now that we have now have positive identification from the engineers at Marshall that this is indeed a portion of the right SRB. Again, I would like to emphasize just a portion. What we have located is a portion of the aft skirt assembly in part of the aft segment. We are going to continue to document this area to identify more components of the right SRB. So I'm sure you're all aware this is a very important step to be able to identify it to this extent. We also have a, a videotape that we took on that area showing some of the components of the right hand SRB aft skirt. You'd roll that video now?
this gives you a good indication of the sea conditions we're working in. You can see those small white objects floating across the screen. That's indicative of the, the Gulf Stream current located at the ocean bottom. It's probably on the order of about a half a knot. The object in the center of the screen there is a hydraulic reservoir for the right-hand SRB. This is part of the thrust vector control system. That is a, the particular item that we recovered and identified through part numbers that that was indeed installed on the right-hand SRB aft skirt. In a moment, you're going to see the, a fuel supply module. This is one of two stainless steel spheres that are installed in each aft skirt. They contain hydrazine, which is the fuel that powers the auxiliary power units that give us the power necessary to run the thrust vector control system. Here you see another part of the aft skirt with some insulation on it. Again, you can see that we've got a lot of small pieces on the ocean floor, meaning it's going to be a very lengthy process to recover all the components. We're doing very limited recovery now so that we can go out there with other assets and do a full photo documentation of the items as they lie in the ocean floor. We're also putting together analytic teams that are going to work with the photography that we have to come up with the best recovery technique and the best chemical and metallurgical techniques for isolating the problem that caused the failure of 51L. We also have in this um, particular segment of video some of the expansion nozzle from the right-hand SRB. It's this phenolic structure, and you can see some of the filaments that are coming out frayed from the inside. We are preparing at this time to send other submersible vessels out to this area to give us better documentation. And again, I'd like to say that you know, there will be still photography supplied to you later, the completion of the briefing by Hugh Harris and his people. Uh, wait. wait. <clears throat> until we uh, have a chance to get the mics to you. Uh, the still pictures uh, that will be released, uh, we can, I think, get a shot of now. And you mentioned the depth of the water. Yes, yeah, so the depth of the water at the area that we found, the aft skirt of the right SRB, is approximately 1,200 feet. The IUS is in... Uh, water depth from about 120 to maybe 150 feet. Okay, okay Hugh would like me to mention too that uh, we are preparing the NR1 now to send out to that area. That will be the prime vessel used for further documentation of the right-hand SRB aft skirt area and its vicinity. Now, we are in the preparation now of getting the crew briefed on what they will see out there in that area, developing detailed planning and documentation so they can go out there and do a, do a job for us. It, it's going to be a lengthy job. The NR-1 is a very, very capable vessel. It's been used in a lot of oceanographic search and activities, a lot of uh, scientific search activities. But again, it is a slow and laborious process to document in that depth of water. Okay, this is uh, on the screen now is another piece of debris from the aft skirt. And I believe that is also a, a view of the fuel supply module. It's a little difficult to see from right here. Yes, that is a fuel supply module on the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Round circular object. Okay, we're going to be bringing that uh, debris in off of the, the vessel that recovered that. They'll be coming in sometime today, hopefully this morning. And uh, at that point in time, we will be doing other analytic checks with it, starting some of the basis, basic analysis of what flight conditions it went through. 
Now the NR1, we expect it'll probably be uh, dispatched out to the debris site uh, as early as Saturday, Saturday morning. Okay, we, we have video of the NR1 uh, coming into port yesterday, which we'll run at this time, and then we'll go to Captain Bartholomew. Uh, th this video was from the, the Navy documentation uh, photographers. And we will also have uh, stills of the, uh, of the scenes that you're seeing uh, for release through the wires. It was towed up until she got into maneuvering condition and they slipped the tow and she came in. Captain Bartholomew, if you'd like to describe what they're seeing in the uh, the supply ship or the mothership here, please feel free to do that. I, I, uh, when we operate the NR1, we always operate it with a, a mothership, if you will, and the ship we saw earlier was the USS Sunbird, which is the submarine rescue ship, and she towed her in, and during transit, the NR1 is towed, either submerged or on the surface, and then when they get in a maneuvering condition, they shake her tow and comes in our own power. That's just a shot of her you know, coming alongside the pier. Okay, Captain Bartholomew is the U.S. Navy Supervisor of Salvage. Okay, I really don't have that much to add to what <coughs> Colonel O'Connor stated. We uh, I set up a task organization under my direction that is orchestrating about 12 ships or submersibles of various sizes and shapes in, in a fairly organized fashion to photo document and recover as necessary as much debris as, as we just finally decide we're going to do. The uh, overall plan as, we, as we're evolving is to search that 250-square-mile box, and we think that's going to take on the order of 60 days. And concurrent with the search, as we identify contacts, uh, we'll be photo-documenting them. The amount of time it takes to really conduct the salvage operation itself will really depend on uh, how much of it we want to recover, its water depth, and the size of the objects. And we have the assets on scene, or will be here by this weekend, capable of picking up essentially the entire SRV if we found one that, you know, intact, which we don't think we will. We'll be using the same lift systems that we recently used in the Air India crash off the, off the, off the coast of Ireland this last fall. And Okay, we're ready for questions now. Please wait for the microphone and identify yourself if I don't call on you by name. Uh, we'll start with Jacqueline Bolden from Channel 6. Two questions. First of all, why can't you get the NR1 out before Saturday? What has to be done? I mean, it got in last, late yesterday afternoon. Why can't it go out right away? Well, as I said, this whole thing is very methodical. We have to brief the crews. Um, this morning, we, they spend a lot of time looking at recovered debris. We have a special navigation system we need to place on these, the mothership so that we can vector the, the submersible right on, onto the station, onto the, the site itself. And we should hear you just takes the logistics to, to go off and do it right the first time. And could you explain a little bit more what makes this, the NR1, so unique, uh, the ability to crawl on the ocean floor, the cameras, why it will be such a big plus? Well, in the, the biggest thing is it recognizes it has unlimited endurance nuclear powered and for example we've been operating the sea link she can put in about uh, six hours on the bottom a day See, this ship can put in 24 hours a day for a mission that could be as long as 20 or 30 days depending on how many people we have aboard so it operates at, at least four times the rate it seats stays independent if it gets rough you can stay down and continue to work it's a more efficient platform uh, Dan Molino from NBC do you know at this point whether you have any debris that reaches up as far as either the factory joint or the field joint, the seams in question in the SRB? No, at this time we don't have any identified debris uh, up to that level. Uh, Jules Bergman from ABC. Uh, for 
Commander Bartholomew. Captain Bartholomew. Thank you. <laughs> they promoted you <laughs> after first demoting you. Uh, I may have missed uh, something on the chart there. Uh, how wide is the 250 more of five? 255 more of my, 255 more, ooh, 255 mile, 254 mile box. The box is, is 10 feet, verti 10 miles vertically and 25 miles long. Okay, and second, how large and heavy an object can the NR-1 recover from the ocean bottom? She's limited to on the order of 1,000 pounds. We don't plan to use her as a primary salvage vessel. So the NR-1 is the eye for a surface recovery vessel. That's correct. Okay. Uh, John, can you honest? Thank you. Uh, Colonel O'Connor, have your pictures of video indicated any sign of, of leaks or burns, uh, problems that we suspect may have caused the accident? Uh, to date, NASA has not been able to use any of the photos that we've taken to document any failure mode. What we have is major portions of the aft skirt that show uh, a lot of damage from impact with the ocean. Do you suspect that you might find uh, the debris up beyond that seal level? Using the NR-1 and other assets, I'm confident we're going to find all of the right-hand SRB. Uh, Jerry Hannafin, Time Magazine. Gentlemen, uh, would you uh, try to put this uh, effort in terms of, uh, of uh, a scale of magnitude to the combined uh, operations and the search for the H-bombs off uh, Spain a long time ago? Roughly, I'd say about the same, although the scenario is quite different. Um, now, I've been involved in this business for 10 years, almost 20, and it's the biggest one we've been involved in since the Palomares, for sure. I'd like to add one thing to that. The Coast Guard activity associated with the initial surface search and recovery of floating debris, they have identified to me as the largest ever search activity they have been engaged in by several orders of magnitude. Okay. Uh, back to uh, Jerry Hannafin, who we're, we may not be hearing. Let's see if it works this time. Uh, it's a quick follow-up. Gentlemen, um, is it correct to report that also by a, a scale of magnitudes, you have improved underwater detection, tracking, photograph, etc. techniques, which you can bring to bear here that you didn't have at the time of the Palomares incident? That's true, but recognize the topography and the nature of this situation is it's a totally different type of search. Uh, Mary Bubb from Reuters. Uh, this aft skirt assembly that you've recovered, that was with the sea link? We haven't recovered it. We have recovered a few small components from it, and that was done by the sea link. Oh, well, uh, how has NASA identified that as being the right solid booster then? Uh, NASA is very methodical in their processing of, of a solid rocket motor or any of the flight components. They have close out photography and detailed tracking by part number. Taking a look at that particular component, and the reason we recovered it was it had an identifiable part number on it, an identifiable configuration. So we brought it to the surface, took the part number and its, all its characteristics and verified it against both close out photography as well as the part number tracking system in, that NASA has. So that the only, only pieces they have are small pieces of the aft skirt assembly? That's, that's correct. But you photographed the entire aft skirt assembly? That's correct. And uh, those other two items that you mentioned you photographed as well? Or are they part of the aft skirt assembly? They are part of the aft skirt assembly. And the whole thing has been photographed. Has anything else been photographed? Uh, we have done other underwater photography uh, in the location, shallower water location where the IUS is. And we're in the process now in going to other sonar contacts and getting videos made of those areas so we can identify the components. There is some geology out in the search area, so occasionally we go out there, get a sonar contact, and we find out it's a piece of geology in the area. We have to rule that out. Also, as uh, many of the people who have been here for a while know, there is an awful lot of missile debris out in that area. And it's, uh, we have to sort through all of that as well. Would the NR-1 be capable of, of bringing up all the pieces of the, that they found of this debris as a right-hand solid booster? Or what would they use? Uh, 
uh, it may be capable from a weight standpoint, but it may not be the most efficient asset to use for that recovery. And in conjunction with Captain Bartholomew's people, we're in the process of going through that and determining the most efficient and accurate way of bringing those components to the surface. Uh, Jay Barbary, NBC. Colonel, uh, you said that you're confident that you will be able to find all the pieces of the SRB, the right SRB. If you find a joint splice, either factory or field joint splice, how long would it take you to bring that up and bring it in for the investigators? Could you give us some time aside 60 days? Could you do it in 48 hours, 24 hours, or a week? Well, the 60 days that uh, Captain Bartholomew mentioned was for photo, photo documentation of the area. To do an actual physical recovery of a large segment could take a considerably longer period of time. It could go as long as four to six months under worst case. You've got to recognize that the, the current conditions are extremely bad out there. At, you're working through 1,200 feet of water with a, a current in a three to four knot range, and that's a long piece of water column to go through and try to do a recovery. Well, this SRB landed full impact on the ocean without parachutes, and as did the first ones off of uh, the first shuttle flight, that broke into pieces like uh, glass being shattered. So you have a lot of pieces out there, but if you find one piece, it may take you just to bring up that one piece four to six months? It depends on what the condition of the piece is and how thorough we want to document that piece before we bring it to the surface. The one you were referring to, I believe, was STS-4, where the parachutes failed to deploy and the cases impacted the water and they were shattered. Mm. Uh, STS-4, uh, no cases material was ever recovered. Photo documentation was adequate. So the basic point is that we're going to go through a very scientific process of documenting what we have using photography and video. We have equipment coming in that can put people on the site. So the failure analysis does not necessarily have to depend on getting all the parts and components to the surface. But the uh, Presidential Commission has been given 120 days to report back to the President. And I'm told that the investigators are very interested uh, in these pieces out there. They may hold the key to the problem. And if you find a piece, and it's essential to the investigation, there's no way that you could get it to them for weeks? It depends on the size of the part that we're trying to get and the weather conditions at sea during that period of time. Uh, I think you can look at the assets employed in this recovery activity now that we're sparing no asset available. We're putting the maximum effort out. And what I'm giving you is the worst case. How about the best case? Well, less than a week. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sue Butler, Hannafin, uh, time. Sue Butler, Time and Space World for Captain Bartholomew. I'm not knowledgeable on Navy other assets. Would you please spell out what the submersibles are besides the NR1 and besides the ceiling and the, and the Germany that you will have in place? And what is the lift capability of the hoist? I believe you were referring to the Air India disaster of the coast of Ireland, you yes. made some mention. So what is the I, capability? I can, I can give you some numbers. We have two manned submersibles, the Sea Lynx and the NR-1. I have three what we call unmanned submersibles. Uh, two are here now and one is coming. One is called the Deep Drone. That's owned by the Navy. We have another one called the Gemini, which is being bought under contract. And we have a third called the Orion, which is owned by the Navy. Essentially, we have those five sensors plus the, so, the commercial side scan sonar, which does the large area search. The capability to lift, uh, we anticipate no lift greater than about 55,000 pounds, but we will have the capability to lift as much as 100 tons. So we can pick up, we'll have the capability, the lift capability on station to pick up the heaviest item we'll see. With what? Uh, we're contracting for an off the oil support type salvage ship called the uh, Workhorse. Uh, Rob Zaya from Channel 2. Uh, just to follow up on the currents issue, uh, how will the NR-1 be better equipped to deal with those currents we saw right there than the other submersibles? The, there's two types of submersibles. One that is, is, is powered from the surface, and these are the kind that are generally don't have much power, and the cables, the umbilicals, they can't hold station. And what we have to do is move that, those assets in closer. The NR-1, once she gets down, the current is less than half a knot, and she can operate almost un unaffected by the current. 
<clears throat> uh, Bill Schmidt, New York Times. On your chart, you, uh, you identify five areas of debris. Uh, could you tell us what you found, or can you identify pieces in each of those areas, or those areas just of sonar contact? Uh, those areas are predominantly sonar contact areas where we have many contacts on the ocean floor. Areas that we have documented and we have recovered components are the closer inshore area where we have the IUS, inertial upper stage, that was to power the TDRS to its final geosynchronous orbit. Other than that, we have no uh, recovered items. We have no documented, uh, defined positions of other specific parts, except the right SRB aft skirt. What, what is the reference to hazardous materials? Hazardous material is reference to the solid propellant that was used by the uh, inertial upper stage. Uh, the inertial upper stage hit the water. It appears to have been intact substantially, and we have fragmented propellant, solid propellant scattered on the ocean's floor there. That is being recovered. Yeah, we're going to take one more question and then go to Houston, but we'll be coming back. We'll get all of your questions. Mike Lafferty from uh, today. I have two quick questions in and a more lengthy one. Um, how much at the present, with the present armada you have assembled, uh, is there an estimate of how much the search is costing each day? I've got the numbers, but I don't have them on top of my head. Okay, we're going we to get that later. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Can we get that later? Yeah. yeah. What ship will be bringing in material today? The, the mothership for the Sea Link. Finally, uh, is this work being done under a con NASA contract with DDMS, or is, uh, is DDMS going to be billing NASA for this work? I am receiving my funding for the operations from DDMS. Okay, we're going to uh, Houston for questions. This is Stephen Gilvain, KTRK TV, Houston. Uh, I'd like to see the uh, uh, sonar picture again for this next question. I'm a little confused as to what that actually showed. It, uh, I, I saw a cylindrical object that seemed to be intact, yet the video and the photographs showed uh, pieces uh, scattered where the individual photographs showed no other piece within the same frame. Uh, so could that be clarified, please? Yeah, I think the problem is the resolution that you have of the, of the sonar trace is not very good. The center uh, highway, if you will, is, is ground scatter from the, from the center path and is irrelevant. The, and it's, a, it's a port and starboard image. But what we actually see are the black dots. Those black dots represent things that are sticking up above the, the level of the ocean. If you see something that is a white, a uh, line underneath the black dot, that's a shadow, and that's how we usually determine the size and height of the object. If the camera could pan left, uh, the, uh, the end of that cylindrical object uh, it, it fans out uh, in some fashion. Uh, what is that? That's just a coincidence and, and has to do with the electronics. It is, again, the, the center part is irrelevant and has nothing to do with the sonar trace per se. That image almost looks like a rocket itself. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Carl is Bowers, Houston Chronicle. Okay, I've got uh, a couple of questions. Earlier on in the uh, recovery process, there was another area that was identified in which I understand there's still uh, warnings uh, to mariners to keep out of this area. It's a circular, described as a circular area, six nautical miles across, and I'd have to go look up the coordinates, but I'm sure you gentlemen are familiar with it. Uh, is that area still off limits to mariners? What action, what is being done there? What do you think that you have there, or what exactly have you found there? I think I can best answer that question. Um, immediately after the, the accident, we were unsure precise locations of all the components that were coming in the water. We also had a tremendous amount of floating debris. So we identified a rather large area to try to protect it so that the Coast Guard vessels and other vessels engaged in surface search could go and recover components. Since that time, we have issued new warnings to mariners, lessening the restriction on the area, and we have been having meetings with the local fishing fleet owners to minimize the impact on their operations, and I'd like to mention that they've been exceptionally cooperative in assisting us in the search activity. So we are trying to reduce that uh, area of concern and caution as quickly as possible. 
Colonel, I'm afraid that's not quite the answer, uh, didn't answer the question. I'm not sure what question you answered, but it wasn't mine. Uh, as I, I understand, apologize. Dude, as of last week, there were still warnings to mariners to totally avoid a circular area six nautical miles across. Uh, th there were undefined operations taking place in that area. I would still like to know what's going on in that area. What do you think you have there? Uh, maybe I'm not aware of the area you're talking to. What we were looking at, as I hope to tell you, was initially we defined a circular area of concern. After we had collected surface debris, and that's what we were interested in in that area, we defined a new area of concern. There is a new notice to mariners out that does not define a circular area of that size. What it defines is a rectangle, as indicated on the charts, 10 nautical miles by 25 nautical miles. Uh, anything else, there is no special highlighted area for other search activities. Now, when we are undergoing dive operations, there are some local restrictions that are put because of the people in the water. You may be referencing to that particular notification. There is no special significance to it other than that we would have divers underwater. Does now, that answer your question? A area. I'll have to uh, find someone that uh, and specify this area very precisely because I'm going to insist on an answer. Uh, Captain, I've, I've, I've had a little uh, background in your type of work, and I am a bit astonished to find you saying four to six months to recover much of anything from that kind of water depth. There are commercial companies that are working free divers at that depth, as I'm sure you're aware. It's expensive, but they get the job done. Uh, if you have a uh, section of the SRB that is needed for this, for this investigation, are you saying it simply cannot be done in less than four to six months? Uh, let, let me answer that, if I might. I'm the one who gave the, the comment of four to six months. What I was trying to reference there is that if we require the recovery of the total right-hand SRB, as it is scattered on the ocean floor at this point in time in small pieces, where we haven't located all the pieces, where there may be major segments that have to be lifted, it could take four to six months for the total recovery. That was the intent of that answer. And I think, you know, if there's a, just a small specific segment that's wanted, naturally it could be brought up much earlier. But for the complete job, it could take four to six months. I hope that clarification helps you. Thank you very much. It does. Uh, it's, I take from what uh, you gentlemen are saying this morning that there is, in fact, no intent to, to uh, totally recover everything. You want to do your documentation and then decide what, if anything, you do want to, uh, to recover. Uh, that is up to the NASA engineers and to the commission to determine what components they specifically would like to retrieve for their analysis. We are preparing the documentation using the naval assets and other assets so that we can, you know, give them the maximum data you know, that we can so they can make their decisions. Do you have a thought of that, has, has there ever been any identification of, the, uh, of anything or even suspected uh, that might be the crew cabin? Uh, in the area searches that we performed to date, there is nothing identified as crew cabin. But I might, point out, yeah. Yeah. Okay. might want to point out that we have only searched 20% of this box at this time. Uh, before coming back here to the Kennedy Space Center, is there any questions from Washington? Okay, no, no questions from Washington. We're back here. We'll start with Bill Whitaker from CBS. Who all uh, is involved with the actual sea uh, search for the right SRB? Are NASA astronauts? down with the Sea Link 2, um, are people from Marshall on board uh, the support ship, as well as other contractors from Thiokol or USBI? Um, let me answer that question. We have put together here uh, a technical team comprised of NASA engineers from Marshall, as well as other centers, uh, associated contractors, as well as members of the uh, astronaut corps. They are all participating in supporting the recovery activity. At this point in time, we are taking the best qualified engineer, whether he be from NASA or from the contractors, uh, 
and putting him aboard the vessel. We have a mixed team at sea to support these operations of both NASA and contractors. No astronaut has dived at this time, though. Uh, Bill Harwood from UPI. Uh, will any astronauts be diving? Is there any plan for anything like that? Uh, there is no plan for them to dive. I, personally, I know of no restriction from them. If, it, if, the, if NASA determines that an astronaut is required to dive, there are many uh, of the astronauts that are well qualified as divers, so I assume we could accommodate them. You, how many, uh, on radar tracking after the explosion, um, do you have any idea of how many large objects or objects at all were being tracked individually, and what's the largest size object you could track individually? Oh, uh, there were some large objects uh, tracked, as large as, uh, as the SRB itself were tracked. Uh, most of them broke up before hitting the water or broke up at water impact. Uh, we are still uh, reducing some metric data to better define the objects we have, we have spotted. Uh, the radars uh, that we are using for that particular launch are the same that we use for all launches. They are predominantly designed you know, to track an intact flight vehicle. When a vehicle breaks up in flight, which particular parts an individual radar tracks is a matter of chance. They tried to identify the largest. We are doing uh, continued signature analysis of the radar signals and doing correlations. I know that's kind of a, a, a widely ranging answer, but I can't give you a better one right now about actual sizes. Okay, but you can't say like four big pieces, five big pieces. I mean, I'm just trying to get a grip on what hit the water. There, uh, initially, we had an identification of, a, of 21 large objects. Those 21 objects, though, were further reduced. Some of them were uh, helicopters in the area, some fixed-wing aircraft that were flying in support of the mission. Again, the radars are moving from target to target. They would pick up something, stay on it for a bit, and we identified as a large target. I think now if you looked at the total numbers, it would be approximately 14 trackable objects. Now, that doesn't give you much indication of the size of that object. Yeah, uh, Jules Bergman. Colonel O'Connor, has there been a Presidential Commission Task Force member designated to work with your, reco your recovery group? And if so, who is he? No one has been identified to me at this time. Uh, Ike Flores from AP. Uh, you mentioned there was some uh, debris being brought in. Uh, can you identify that again for us, please, today? The debris that is being brought in today is uh, the hydraulic reservoir from the right-hand SRB aft skirt. The one that we, the one that has the part number that identified that we were indeed on the right hand SRB. Uh, Mike Hursley, Chicago Tribune. Two questions. Number one, it appears that a portion, and perhaps even a large portion, of the uh, SR, the right SRB debris is outside the uh, 250 square mile box. Can you explain that? Uh, Search that area. Yes, yeah, so that is a special search area because uh, the SRBs, as you're well aware, were still thrusting after the explosion. Therefore, they continued to fly, and uh, they were further out of the, the major area of debris because of their propulsive nature up until the time range destruct signal was sent. Is that then within the box? Is, is that going it, to it is slightly outside the box, but there is a special subset of SRB search activity going on and it is based on the, the metric data from the radars, which took the right-hand SRB close to the surface of the water. So that's a special search area. The second question, has the, has the clock begun on the 60-day period? Did that start uh, when, the, uh, when these efforts began, or is it 60 Sorry, days from February. now? Pardon me? 8 February, we started the search. OK, um, in the second row. <clears throat> Richard Sanza from Newsweek Magazine. Colonel, you said earlier that uh, even if you couldn't recover something, you had the capability, what seemed like you had the capability to go down there and look at it. Will you, can you really do that at 1,200 feet? You could actually have someone go down and inspect a particular piece of one of these? The NR1 can go down there. It has manipulators, and it has uh, some high-resolution TV, and it can uh, provide excellent documentation of an object on the bottom at that depth. No. No. Okay, the, the question that, in case people were listening, was can you free dive at that depth? And the answer was no. Uh, back, uh, I forgot your name. Uh, Mike Isikoff with the Washington Post. I'm still a little unclear on the uh, scope of the, uh, or scale of the operation. You mentioned before 12 ships, I believe, and then you okay. said five submersibles. Uh, there's seven ships. Uh, and also, you mentioned the Coast Guard input on this. Are there separate? 
This one's Coast Guard. I can run through the Armada if you like uh, one more time. The Coast Guard is no longer involved. We essentially picked up, when they finished their surface part of the recovery, we picked up the, the task for the underwater search. Uh, we, they have made uh, small boats available if we need them just to shuttle people, but essentially the Coast Guard is no longer involved in the operation. I have three ships that are committed to doing the detailed search uh, for this area. And essentially that involves, it's kind of like plowing a field or mowing a lawn. They go in straight lines, 10 miles down, make a U-turn, come another straight line that's displaced by 100 meters, and they, they're continuing in sectors within that, and that'll take... What kind of ships are those? These are primarily the, the NASA SRB retrieval vessels that are used for the normal booster retrieval. We've outfitted them with our special sonar, and those are our primary... Uh, search, large area search. Surface yes, yes. Those are three surface vessels doing that. We have, of course, the Navy uh, Preserver, which is a Navy salvage ship out of Little Creek, Virginia. She's the primary diving asset, and she's been bringing in a lot of debris in the 100 to 150 foot depth range. Uh, we have another support ship that is, has on board the deep drone vehicle. Uh, that They're doing what we call the localization and verification of the contact. So she, she goes down verifies that it's a, it's a rock or it's a piece of the booster, and then we target that side for subsequent uh, salvage operations. Uh, back here. Yeah, Mike Leary, Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, is the NR-1 going to go out uh, initially to the uh, right SRB area? And can you tell me how large that area is? Well, we have two debris fields in that area. One of them is nominally 700 meters by 100 meters. That's, that's the one that was interrogated pretty thoroughly by the sea link. Adjacent to that is another debris field on the order of 5,000 meters by 200 meters. We don't know what that is at this point. But she'll be going out and photo documenting those, that general area with those two debris fields. And will, it be going to... and will it be going out there first? Is that its first priority? Yes. The SRB okay. is my, remains my guidance is the highest priority in, in the, of the operation. Okay. Also in the, in the video, uh, and I think Colonel O'Connor can help with this, when you showed the picture of the expansion nozzle, it appeared to be lined with a yellow material. Was that the insulation? I think what you were looking at there was, um, well, let me describe very quickly how the, the nozzle is formulated. There is tape that is prepared that is wound on a ma mandrel to form that nozzle. When it hit the water, we believe it is shattered, and some of that tape is splayed out. And I think that may be what you're looking at at the nozzle. There was some insulation on another component that was shown in there, and that was for heat protection. But we'd have to go back over the video to say what exactly that was that you're referring to. Uh, Harry Colcom from Aviation Week. Uh, Captain, how, uh, how do you uh, bring 100 tons to the surface? Do you put flotation bags underneath? No, what we'll do, we, we have 100-ton cranes. Uh, on, the, on the salvage ship, and, and the really the only hard part of the operation is, is making the attachment to the objects. Uh, you know, normal aircraft salvage is pretty easy. You have thin metal, you grab on with something, and they're fairly light. But we'll, we're going to have to make attachments remotely, you know, in, in one inch, one half inch thick steel, and we're developing some special tools that will punch holes in the steel so we can grab it and make the attachment safely, and then it's a matter of winching it up. <coughs> And we have motion compensating devices that will keep any snap loads from developing as we come up. Uh, Rob Zaya. Just a minor point of clarification. When you talk about the hydraulic reservoir system, are you just basically talking about part of the booster steering system? That's right, the thrust vector control system. Uh, uh, Bill Harwood. Um, I just want to get you to clarify something for me, and I'll preface it, but I understand the difficulty of searching a large area like this. Um, but you're saying here that three weeks after this, this thing happened, that the only thing you've seen that's even recognizable in any sense of the word is that right SRB. All the debris fields you've looked at, you've seen absolutely nothing that people even suspect is any any particular section of a, of a shuttle or, or the other SRB. No, no. Uh, we also mentioned that we do have the IUS, inertial upper stage, which is the payload. Uh, the, we have a tremendous amount of material that was brought in in the surface search. As you're well aware, I think you've seen photography of some of that. The underwater picture is much more difficult. You know, we're looking for fairly large objects underwater. We have one um, preliminary identification of a component that may be part of the left SRB. We're still going through and trying to get that verified. Uh, it's a large area, 
and it's, it's going to take time to go through it. And it's, uh, we've had some difficult sea states at different times where we've had to bring the vessels off of the search area. So we're weather dependent, and we've got a large area to search. Uh, Mary, Bob. Um, how large were these pieces of debris from the, um, the uh, that they brought up that they identified? As, or did they identify them from these pieces or from the photographs or both? Are you talking about the SRB or the IUF? The SRB, there are other small pieces. Uh, we'll supply with the photography some uh, exact sizes. But for instance, the sphere that you saw contains approximately three and a half gallons of hydrazine. So it's a rather small, small piece. It is about 15 inches in diameter. The hydraulic uh, uh, reservoir that you saw is 11 and a half inches in diameter and it's approximately 20 inches long. Uh, Ike Flores. <clears throat> Can you tell us precisely in mileage uh, where these two SRBs or the two SRB zones are from the Cape? No, I would say they're about 43 nautical miles from shore. That's very approximate. Um, yeah. So those are the only the only two objects that you've actually recovered are the hydraulic uh, reservoir and the other the the sphere. No, we've recovered the hydraulic reservoir. The sphere was photographed on the bottom. The only thing you've recovered is the hydraulic reservoir. Yeah. That was an intentional process of leaving it there so we have photo documentation of where it is on the floor. You know, we're making sure that we uh, have no opportunity to destroy any evidence. So we're taking a very cautious approach of taking photography and video, bringing it back, having the engineers review it in detail, develop a detailed recovery plan to preserve absolutely every shred of evidence available to us. Okay, we're going to go to Houston for one more question. I wonder if you could update us on the recovery of any personal effects or remains uh, in the last uh, week or so? Uh, it's a policy not to comment on that. Okay, can you tell me if you have found any personal effects? No, I can't. Okay, That's back, from Houston. back here at Kennedy Space Center, Jacqueline Bolden. Back to the size of things, I'm just trying to get a grasp in, in what you've identified in the right solid rocket booster area, the pieces that you think are the right SRB. Is it my understanding that the largest piece that you have identified is the hydraulic reservoir, 11 and a half inches in diameter? No, probably the, the largest identifiable element is uh, the expansion nozzle, which is probably a piece maybe as large as uh, 10 foot long. That was not recovered. and that would not characterize a right or a left SRB. What we were focusing on with those photographs are things that would let you say this is a right-hand SRB or a left-hand SRB. Okay, and do you know how many pieces that you have identified in the right SRB area that you think is part of the right SRB? We think the entire debris field that we're photographing at this time is associated with the right-hand SRB. We have to document all the, the pieces and parts down there, some of them are very small. I couldn't at this time give you a total parts count, but it, it is very high. Uh, 30. 30 identifiable pieces. Uh, there's going to be a lot of other smaller fasteners, other debris out there. Uh, again, it's an extensive debris field, and we've just started the process of fully documenting it. Okay, we only have time for a couple more questions, but I think we're winding down. Uh, Bill Schmidt from New York Times. I think you just answered. We're trying to get an estimate of the number of sonar hits or pieces. You say around 30 would be the, the whole? 30 components that we have have video from. That, that particular debris field is fairly extensive, and we don't have all the, the videotape and films back from that effort at this time. But there are many more pieces that you There are more pieces out there. Uh, would you have, could you give us any sort of ballpark idea? We're talking about dozens? I, I would hate to do that because you get out in that area of the ocean, there could be uh, rocks out there that we're imaging with sonar, other, de other debris. Rather than speculate on that, I'd rather complete the mapping that we're doing and give you a precise number. Uh, Jules Bergman. Captain Bartholomew, the first underwater search I took part in was the Thresher back before the Civil War. Assuming that that is within your memory, 
do you think that the probable cause of the Challenger explosion will be found as well as that uh, was? I'm just not qualified to second guess uh, the NASA engineers in the investigation. I'll just get the pieces for them and they'll have to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Can you, uh, can you describe a, a little bit about the process of who is going to be aboard the, uh, the ship and is going to decide what piece has priority to be lifted and then again how soon that could be done if there is someone who can identify this, yes, this is a piece that's essential to the investigation? Uh, the way we're going to do that is we're, we have identified a team of Marshall engineers, other support contractor engineers, they are going to be placed on the, the vessels going out to the area. A NASA engineer will go down with the crew of the NR-1 to be the on-spot expert to help identify the components and, and try to um, do a preliminary sort of priority targets. When that information is gathered and the photography is brought back here, we'll establish another team that will look at all the components in detail and try to understand from the breakup pattern, their condition on the sea floor, what may be important in the recovery activity. So it's going to be a very methodical, a very logical progression of photographic data with on-site experts to make sure the pho photographs are properly taken, showing the right parts in the right perspective. And then the team back here looking through that information, <coughs> determining and recommending to the to the task force or to the commission, which parts and in what priority they be recovered. Nothing is recovered until. Well, well, wait, 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 wait for the mic because the. The onshore uh, team will first decide what is what is to be recovered from photographic evidence. Nothing is recovered before the photos have come back here and someone has decided that it should be picked up. The only exception to that was with uh, that hydraulic reservoir, where we needed to pick that up so we could identify a part number that we were indeed on that right SRB. Uh, okay, final question from Sue Butler Hannafin. Excuse me, <coughs> I did not quite understand who the NASA people will be who will be going down on the NR1 to be the experts to use their eyeballs to see and identify pieces that would be, that in their opinion would be important to bring up. Uh, I can't give you a name of who will be going down on the vessel, but, um, but NASA is providing to the Navy a list of people that are qualified to, to go down with the submarine, and they are establishing the priority of the individual and who should go for each particular area. It's obvious that uh, a vehicle of the shuttle's type is very sophisticated, and there are different specialties for different areas. So it's going to vary with specialty who goes down on a particular dive. Okay, we have one more final question. Newsweek. Richard Sanza from Newsweek. Has a decision been made whether you will retrieve every piece of this shuttle, orbiter, etc., or are you just going to pick up pieces of evidence that relate to the investigation? At this time, uh, there has been no final decision on how much will be recovered. You know, we, we know we will recover a significant portion of it, and it's going to be up to NASA to tell us how much they feel they need to complete their analysis. Okay, thank you very much. We will have the, uh, the status report on the vehicles and on the underwater search out shortly. We've been getting together this briefing for you first. And the, the still pictures uh, have to be captioned and will be distributed, and the, uh, the videotapes dubbed and distributed. Thank you all. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay.